Hello, welcome to the webinar. We're just waiting for a few more folks to show up. Hi, welcome to the webinar. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes for more attendees to join us. Right. Um, I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, Steve, you want to take it away? Uh, welcome, everyone, to our webinar today. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about a case study on a SharePoint implementation. Uh, today's webinar is uh, a joint effort of the Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, so LSNTAP and Just Tech. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, questions are welcome. You can type your questions in the, uh, the chat feature of Zoom there um, where, where we can. We'll take those during the presentation, but we'll also save time at the end to, uh, to take your questions. Uh, so maybe we'll start with some uh, introductions. Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll start with uh, uh, me, I guess. So I'm Steve Pomeroy, Director of Marketing for Just Tech. Uh, I've been in the technology space for over 20 years now in a variety of different uh, technical leadership, uh, sales and marketing roles as well. I'm happy to be your, uh, your guide, your facilitator during the webinar today. Uh, also joining me, I have John Froyo, uh, Deputy Director at De Novo Center for Justice and Healing in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, John has served as DeNovo's Deputy Director since December 2015. Uh, he started at DeNovo in 2001 as the Housing and Disability Supervising Attorney. He was promoted, promoted to DeNovo's Assistant Legal Director in 2004. And prior to working at DeNovo, John was the Pro Bono Legal Project Coordinator at Tri-City Community Action Program in Malden and an attorney in private practice. Um, John has dedicated his career to combating the effects of poverty and violence by providing equal access to justice. John received his law degree from New England School of Law, and he has served as a co-chair of the Boston Bar Association Delivery of Legal Services section. So thank you, John, for, uh, for making time for us today. Also joining me, I have Tony Liu. Tony is a senior consultant with, uh, with Just Tech, and Tony has dedicated his career to serving low-income communities and increasing access to justice through technology innovation. Tony began his career as an Open Society Institute fellow at the Urban Justice Center, representing low-wage workers in the domestic work and restaurant industries in New York, and later joined the staff at the New York Legal Assistance Group as an immigration attorney. In 2010, he joined Pro Bono Net, where he helped to develop and implement projects that use technology to support pro bono attorneys. And Tony later became a product manager for the Immigration Advocates Network, where he spearheaded the development of new online platforms to help immigrants determine their legal options to apply for naturalization. Tony also served as a director of pro bono for community legal aid, SoCal. And he received his BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and his JD from NYU School of Law. Uh, thanks for, uh, for joining us today, uh, Tony, and thanks to all of you out there for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to attend our webinar. So let's talk about the agenda. 
so real quick, uh, we're going to give a, a quick overview of, uh, of SharePoint, what it is. Then we'll dig into the, uh, I guess, the meat and potatoes of the webinar, uh, which, which is the case study. So we want to talk about DeNovo's initial SharePoint implementation there. Uh, following that, we're going to dig into uh, some of the refinements and improvements uh, that DeNovo uh, has worked on since that initial implementation. We'll then talk about some of the key considerations uh, when thinking about uh, implementing SharePoint. And as I mentioned, we'll follow that up with, uh, with some Q&A. And with that, uh, over to you, Tony, to talk about uh, SharePoint. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, so the one of the most important things to realize when you're thinking about a SharePoint project is that it was designed to be a collaborative platform. Um, and, and this is a really kind of essential um, thing to kind of to understand because um, as a product, its identity is meant to be both collaborative. Um, so it's driving people to, uh, to interact and to uh, work together on all of its content. And it's also, because it's a platform, it's very kind of, it's extremely flexible, it's wide open. Um, that brings with it a lot of um, strengths, but a lot of challenges as well, because there's no clear guardrails. Um, and so there's a lot that you can do with it. Um, it's it's uh, generally, particularly um, the, the online version of Share, SharePoint that most uh, organizations are using these days is, is integrated with Microsoft Office by default. Um, and it's also um, primarily used for content management. So things like news, um, key uh, important links, events, documents, um, and lists, which kind of functions as a built-in database. So you can really use it for a lot of different purposes. And, and I think the, the best way to kind of think about it is um, captured in that quote, um, think of SharePoint as a Swiss army knife of content management. It can pretty much become anything you wish it to be. Um, and by the same token, because it's kind of like a Swiss army knife, it may not be the best tool for any single purpose, but can be used for lots of different things. Um, next slide. Yep. So um, the other thing to think about is that there are a lot of ways to integrate SharePoint with um, other software. As I've mentioned before, by default, it's it's very um, integrated with Office, uh, Microsoft Office, and the various uh, applications and, and services that Microsoft offers um, within those licenses. And so um, Microsoft Teams off the bat is integrated with SharePoint um, as are their sort of core Office suite, um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneDrive, uh, which is Microsoft's uh, kind of like Microsoft's answer to Dropbox um, is, um, is very deeply integrated with SharePoint um, in some ways. Um, and so whether you like it or not, when you roll out a SharePoint project, if you are using any of these other things, there will be implement, um, implications for how you use Teams or Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, OneDrive, et cetera. Um, so that's, a, that's something to always keep in mind is uh, you may think, oh, I'm just gonna um, build a SharePoint project, but in rolling SharePoint out to your organization, it will potentially impact the user experience for these other platforms as well. There's also external integrations. Um, so things uh, like case management systems and John will talk a little bit about their integration with Legal Server um, as a case management system, um, as well as other software. <laughs> and there are a lot of uh, ways you can integrate SharePoint with lots of different software platforms. A lot of that is sort of out of the scope of what we're going to talk about today because they often require um, heavy customization, but it's just something to think about um, as you're moving forward that it can be integrated with other systems, but oftentimes that integration requires, um, it's almost like a project in and of itself to get the integration to work. Um, and then just um, to kind of set the table for sort of the life cycle of a SharePoint project, there's the initial conception of the project, which is, uh, you know, what do we want to do um, well, what particular problem do we want to solve with SharePoint? Um, and then the initiation phase where you're trying to figure out how you want to implement it, who should be involved, who should be responsible, which then leads into the discovery phase where you are trying to figure out your requirements. 
um, and then figuring <laughs> figuring out what your SharePoint um, setup needs to be needs to do kind of specifically. Then uh, you move into a design phase where you're trying to um, understand the architecture and what components specifically within SharePoint you'll be using, um, which then feeds into an implementation phase and testing phase to actually build things out, make sure they're doing what you expect them to do. And then the launch, which is the wider rollout to your, your users, which would um, in most cases with SharePoint be your staff. Um, so with that, um, back to Steve. Great, thanks, thanks, Tony. Thanks for, for setting the, the table that way. So obviously there's a, it's a big undertaking when it comes to SharePoint. Um, so with that, what, what I'd like to do is kind of transition over to John and have John uh, start to take us through uh, DeNovo's experience. So John, over to you. Okay, so what I thought I'd talk about first was talk to you about DeNovo itself, who we are and what, what um what we do so we're a combination and would you mind moving to the next slide so what we do is we provide services to um, both both legal and mental health services together on one organization and what that is and did and does is it really makes it a little more complicated this type of implementation because we have to respect the privileges and confidentiality requirements of attorneys as well as mental health professionals so but we're an organization that provides both of those services at times it's together and otherwise we could just provide legal services to clients or mental health services our staff we have about 30 staff members that's broken down to be about 13 attorneys five um, social workers and then the rest would be either admin staff or support staff. And um, within the program, we actually further break it down to six different units or six different programs. We have our council and each of those units um, has probably between five to seven staff members. So we have our counseling program, we have a disability benefits um, unit, which is our smallest unit, which only has one FTE. But then we have a domestic violence family law unit, a housing unit, an immigration unit, and admin. And each of those units and um, components of the organization use SharePoint. It's it's all in one way, but it's a little bit different for each because they have the each have their own unique um, needs. And we really and I will talk about this in a minute. But we really tried to work in the entire organization into our build out of um, SharePoint. I think Tony, are you? John, um, just uh, a follow up on your um, on your organization kind of structure. Can you talk a little bit about your technology infrastructure and, and capacity? Okay, so um, because of the size of the organization, we we don't have internal staff who um, who are the people who work on technology. I'm I'm the main person who oversees technology within the organization, but that's one of about eight hats that I wear. Um, I, and also the other thing is I'm just an accidental techie. I really don't have any experience. And I just, I'm just not afraid, I guess. And um, so, uh, so I oversee it with everything else I do within the organization. But then we also work pretty closely at times with Just Tech where um, they have helped us reconfigure our case management system, legal server, as well as implementing this program. And we have outside IT services who help with us with the hardware and um, with a lot of um, support for our staff members where they'll do that remotely. So we don't have a big internal capacity, but I think with what we do a lot with what we have. Great, thanks. So John, in, in thinking about the, uh, the de novo's move to, to SharePoint, I wonder what some of the, uh, the business drivers were. Okay. So, so what happened was, and this, this goes back now about three years, three, three and a half years ago, where um, I, I knew that we had an internal, we had a server on site where we stored everything. We had about 40 years of files on that server because each time we upgraded, we brought everything with us. Um, and that server was about just, it was approaching five years, being five years old. And it was my understanding from talking to the, tech people that are outside consultants, as well as um, some research I've done, was that you should really replace your server every five years 
just because um, you, you run the danger of something happening to the server and it crashing. And we, we definitely didn't want to be in that situation. And actually, five years prior to um, looking at a way to try to, uh, to, to either bring on a new server or coming up with a new plan on saving our, um, our documents, a document manager program, five years earlier, our system actually did crash and we lost everything for two to three weeks. So I didn't want to be in that situation another time. Um, so what we decided to do was to, instead of spending the money on bringing in a new server and migrating the 40 years of um, organic growth that was on that server, we decided to um, see if we could move all of our function to the cloud. Um, and as part of our grant writing process, we wrote a grant to um, to have to migrate to the cloud, and we put it in place. And, and the luck on our part, the one it was really we were really lucky because we actually started this process prior to the pandemic, um, so we we had no idea how more useful and significant it would be. And we unfortunately we didn't have it rolled out. Um, in March or April of 2020, we had just we had been working on the migration process probably two to three months prior to that. But within six months of everybody being remote, we were up using we were using the cloud, and I mean that was really it. We were really it really benefited a lot us a lot because the first six months we had people VPN inning to the server, and there was a bunch of for me it was a big concern because that really opened up a lot of security. Um, Holes and so forth, and it wasn't the best way to operate. But um, but because we had this project in process, we were able to fairly quickly move into um, the cloud-based case management and document management system. I think to touch on this in, in what you shared, John. But what what really led to to SharePoint? What okay, and with with SharePoint itself, we um we already had Office three sixty five and. Um, for our, and that whole system we were using for our mail server, our email server, and um, we but we never fully utilized it. And but because we were already part of that system, we thought it made sense, and we use we use all Microsoft products, so we thought it made sense to integrate them all into one system, and to and that was a way that we could not have to have a server on site. But really, give people remote access to um, to anything they would need from the organization. And uh, again, I think we'll touch on some of this as well. But in terms of the objectives, so you, you talked a little bit about the move to cloud, some of the the security um, benefits there as well. Um, the, any other kind of objectives you had in mind in moving to SharePoint? I think to make it to one big concern of mine was that if you if you looked at the structure of our um, file system within the um, within uh, with on our server. If any of our attorneys were not able to, were, um, something happened to them, and somebody else had to go into their file system and see what was going on with cases and so forth. Um, that would be really difficult for them because each attorney did it in a different way, and you wouldn't necessarily know what was there or where it was. We really wanted to. Um, organize our documents in a way that anybody would understand what other people within the organization were doing. We also, a big part of it, and this might be more for the admin team, but it does have some effect on the on the um, attorneys and social workers, is just the collab collaborative piece of it, where a lot of times um, I may be, myself and our um, development director, may be working on a at grant application. And by us being able to be in the document at the same time, we're able to edit it, see what the other person is saying, and really collaborate on um, on any changes or the final product of that document, which really helps out a lot. And, and you're no longer guessing which is the final document, because within um, the SharePoint world, there's a versioning, um, a versioning part of it where each version is saved upon itself so you can go back to any version but you always have the most recent version as the one that's available readily available yeah it's fantastic definitely lots of benefits there um rucha next slide please yeah so i i think uh I, i'll talk a little bit about um what 
Denovo actually built in SharePoint, kind of using the sort of way we as um, you know technologists that help implement SharePoint kind of think about the architecture in some ways. So um, Denovo is using SharePoint as a document management system, and as John mentioned, you know there's a lot of <laughs> benefits to that. Um, in terms of managing both administrative documents and then also um, resources for staff uh, to be able to um, access um, both in terms of you know um, practice resources, um, uh, also practice and procedure resources, just generally operational resources for the organization and forms, right? And, and those are typically um, what organizations will, will use SharePoint for is to, you know, if somebody needs a travel reimbursement form, Put it on SharePoint rather than emailing the, the one person in the department that you're always um, needing to get it from. Um, there's also um, it's also set up to allow the the various groups um, practice groups that John mentioned um, to have their own site, and so each of those sites will have their own section of useful links that are relevant to that particular team, as well as sample documents um, and forms. So these could be um, legal practice related samples like sample briefs things like that um, <laughs> uh, legal resource library for each of the practice groups as well as um, as john mentioned the case files and that leads to the final piece which is that it's integrated with um, de novo's case management system legal server um, for all case related documents um, anything you want to add john about kind of what what you built initially I mean, I think that pretty much covers it. Great. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Rucha, next slide, please. No. Uh oh, we may have lost the connection. Okay. Um, One second. Let me just uh, see if I can <laughs> jump in and pick up where we were. See you. I you have... pull, it, pull it up or drop me. I can I I oh, think I pretty Ru much know what's on the next slide if... So Rucha, are you are you back with us? <laughs> are you able I'm to back. I'm able to I just shared it out again. I'm sorry? Are you able to see my screen? I just shared that again. Uh, okay. Well, let's let's keep going and see if uh, if this works. I know. Apologize, but I've connected to the issues. Yeah, R Rich is in Florida, and there have been you know recent events in Florida that may impact things like internet connectivity. Um, so this is a screenshot of the Novo's homepage. Um, I just well, oh, there we lost it. <laughs> about now yeah okay it's a screenshot of denova's homepage, um and so i just wanted to kind of break down the site structure a little bit um we won't get too deep in the weeds of it but um essentially this um you'll see at the top um that horizontal bar that has um, global links which is the um, home administration counseling case management links so those are um that's the global navigation bar that follows the user you know every on every subsequent site that they're on. So if they were on the housing site, they would still see all of those links the same way. Um, everyone often talks about SharePoint um, in the sense that like, oh, this is our intranet site. The intranet is actually technically a combination of sites, right? So the legal site, um, the family, housing, all of those links that you see at the top are actually their own independent SharePoint sites that are all tied together by a hub. And so, um, so, um, so it's helpful to think about the uh, a SharePoint implementation more as a constellation of different sites that you can kind of connect together. And what that's all held together by is that search bar above that um, horizontal navigation where it says search across all sites. That's what um, SharePoint kind of um, that's the glue that's kind of connecting on the sites is you can run a search that will search for content within any of those, um, those sites across all of them. If you do want to kind of narrow your search, you could just, um, you know, visit one site specifically, and then it would be narrowed to that um, searching within that site. So this is a um, what's called a hub 
uh, site within SharePoint. Um, and so uh, very logically, the hub site is typically your, your homepage where you kind of start when you, um, when you are going to your SharePoint implementation. Um, there's, uh, there are some um, visual links there in the middle, um, and those are typically used to kind of call the, call the visitor's attention to specific content that you want them to kind of zero in on. But then off, also to the right, there's a, a vertical list of quick links, and those are often used to kind of um, link to very common um, sites or categories of sites, <laughs> or even sometimes external resources like um, uh, like it could be a link to your case management system to give it, um, give your staff very easy access to those things. Um, and then on the left side, there's another vertical navigation and those are um, typically, those, that's another quick navigation bar. And that's used to identify resources within the site that you're in. So it's like a sub navigation for this hub site. So you could imagine in the family site, there would be a quick navigation on the left that would point to potential resources and uh, document folders that were specific to the family um, family law group. So um, that's kind of the breakdown of how the sites are structured. There's a lot of flexibility within the, um, how you set up a SharePoint site. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is not by any means the only layout you could set up, um, but this is a very common layout that is used because the um, navigation pieces are very kind of clearly laid out and, um, and, and easy for users to follow. I will point out also that SharePoint, um, the modern SharePoint and the online version of it is um, designed to be a responsive website, which means that if, um, viewing it on a mobile site uh, works pretty well. I mean, a mobile device works pretty well and, and the, elements, the navigation elements and everything get rearranged depending on the size of your, um, the screen that you're using. Um, not that I imagine many legal services staff are trying to access an internet on their mobile device, but um, it is also, um, it in injects a certain level of um, or limitations in terms of layout options because, uh, because of that responsive design. Um, so I guess with that, we'll, <laughs> we'll go ahead and talk about, you know, the implementation process. Um, back to you, John. So the first thing we did to move towards the impl implementation process was to put together a team um, of staff members to really be involved and come up with a plan. What I really wanted was when I put together the team, I wanted somebody that's almost like a champion from each unit to be on this team so that the, that person could go and meet with the respective units on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and give them feedback what was going on, as well as bring feedback back to the team about what we should be doing with that SharePoint site. Um, and the other thing I thought that was really important about this process was to not have just not to have more than just all of the people who really felt comfortable with technology. I really wanted to have some members on our team who were uncomfortable with technology because I thought they would be able to give us good insight as to what others might be concerned about as we move forward. And going into the process, and this really bared out to be true, was that I figured about 20 to 30% of the staff um, would be excited about um, having access to SharePoint and using this new technology. About 50% of the staff would kind of be ambivalent and they would try to use it, but they um, they really they they weren't excited about it. But they they would try it, and then about twenty percent of the staff just didn't would never want any part of it. And my whole approach was to try to make sure that we bring that middle fifty percent because I figured if we got that fifty percent, we knew we'd get the thirty percent, and even some of the twenty percent who were unenthusiastic might be brought along. So that was really what the focus was, and that's. That I strategically put together the team to hopefully um, make it more likely that this implementation would succeed, and um, and that's I mean that that's that's what the team was made up of, and it, I think it really worked well. If you want to move on to the next slide. 
Okay, and, and the actual implementation process. Um, the team met weekly, but then a consultant from Just Tech joined us every other week. And uh, in between meetings, what would happen was that the staff members who were part of that team would be have decision making um, decision making content that they'd have to bring back to their individual units, talk to the unit about it, and then we'd all come back together and make decisions based on the feedback that we received from the um, from the organization. That those team members were also responsible for gathering content. Um, from each of the units to make sure that what any, but whatever anybody would need up in SharePoint, it would be there and it would be in a place that um, that would make sense. And and as part of the team, and we Denovo is an organization that um, relies heavily on volunteers as well. As part of the process, we also added a volunteer to um, to our team, and and with our luck, she was a retired um, librarian. So she really helped us through the process and really think about how we should structure our file system within um, SharePoint. So she worked with us as, along with Just Tech to really put together an outline, looking at what we had on our, on our G drive or our server drive, looking at all that content and then coming up and figuring a way that it should be structured in a consistent and systematic way within SharePoint. And we, we kind of mapped out on, um, I think it was on Excel, what subfolders would be and everything. And we, I think she might've taken the first pass at it, brought it back to our committee. And then we talked about it amongst ourselves. And then each unit went back and talked about it with their staff members as well, because we really wanted buy-in across the organization. And eventually what we did was we came out with this new structure that incorporated everything we needed. And prior to it being built on SharePoint, we actually built it on our server so that the new structure was built on the server as a staging area. And then we had, and this process took about eight months. So it wasn't done overnight, but we had each, and this is for non-case related documents, but we had each unit go ahead and move, copy all of the content that they wanted into the new structure, um, into the new structure so that so that all of the files were living on the server, but in a structure different than it had been for 40 years. And what that did was by having the newly designed structure right on the server, it I think made it a lot easier for um, the Just Tech team to migrate everything into the newly built structure within SharePoint. Um, we also had to have a special staging area for our case related documents. Um, as part of that process, we made a strategic decision to only move the case related documents for active clients. And how we set that up was we, we um, set up a separate folder for client files and the file name was the, the actual file number and then an underscore and the client's, the client's name or the client's last name. The reason why we did it that way was so that staff the staff members could start to use a new structure on the server, but they wouldn't just be looking at a client number. They could still look at their the client name as well and know what case it was for. And they start they emptied all the documents or they copied all the documents into this new structure and then started to work live in that new structure until the date when we migrated everything. And again, what Just Tech was able to do based on the way we named the file folders, they were able to pair it up, uh, attach it to the legal server file based on the file number. Um, this whole process took about eight months, but, um, but because we did all this prep work, I think because we had a lot of people within the organization part of the process, it really made the go live portion of it a lot easier. Um, and I guess, do you, could we go to the next um, next slide? Um, the, the, and this is, yeah. So, and the key things we were looking at, so after we, that was one part of it. We also wanted to design and um, implement the SharePoint site. And the key things that we really wanted was consistency for, for all of users. One thing that really concerned us, like I said earlier, about our file system within on the server, it grew organically um, 
some of our staff members had been with the organization for 25 or 30 years, but there were some staff members who were here a few were here a few years. And each person used a totally different filing system, which if anything happened to any of them, I don't think any of us would have been able to figure out what they had done just because each person did their own thing. But this the consistency really would make it easier for everybody in the long run. And the user experience was really important to us too, where we wanted we wanted to make sure it was a simple, simple, straightforward process that everybody would understand. Um, but we also understood that although we wanted the consistency, we also wanted to make sure that each practice group um, was able to make their own decisions. And one example of this, like um, Tony, I think it said earlier, we built a special subsite for each of the practice groups. And they decided what links they wanted up there, what subfolders they wanted on the left-hand side with the um, forms and documents. And we gave them a lot of leeway just because we felt that they knew what they needed, what, what would be best for them. Um, and like I spoke about earlier, we made that strategic decision to only connect active files with legal server. But um, we had many files within the server that were for clients who have closed the, ca the cases they have been closed over the past 15 years. Since we didn't connect those up with legal server, we wanted to make sure that there is a way that staff members, if needed, had access to those folders. What we decided to do with that was once we cleaned up everything we wanted to clean up within the server drive and moved everything to the staging area, anything that was left we didn't want to um, delete or get rid of, we wanted to just leave it there. We then had Just Tech um, migrate that to a special archive section of SharePoint. And now we have limited access and myself and maybe one or two other people have access to that archive file. And if any staff member wants to have access to their closed client files, they're able to reach out to us. I can do a simple search and within two or three minutes, I can get them what they needed. Um, but the reason why I don't wanna open access to the archive site to everybody is because I don't want people working in that archive site and I also don't want them deleting stuff. I'd like to just leave it as it is. So it's limited, there's limited access, but pretty much anything that anybody may have left on the server, they can have access to because of this, this archive was um, created. Um, right, so, so many things, uh, so many uh, questions, I guess I have there, but just that idea of the, the archive and being able to sort of separate that out from the present and go forward uh, but, but one of the I guess one of the questions I do have for you um, any surprises anything that kind of unexpected that jumped out during that uh, kind of design as you're as you're working through there um, I I think that the I mean the one the one kind of not surprise but I mean as I said different people have had different levels of involvement and and just thinking about right now, and I don't know if I had said this, but every two to three months, so maybe three to four times a year, I have somebody, one of the staff members come back to me and say, can you get me something out of the archive? The, um, the person who didn't want to be part of this project at all, and really, I mean, she definitely was part of the 20%. She's the one who contacts me most often and asks me for stuff, I think mainly because because she wasn't involved. So the more you can get everyone involved in the whole process, I think you're better off. And like I said, I think there's some people just because they're afraid of technology or whatever it might be, they may not be involved, but it really, that's one thing that I really try to focus on. And as much as you do that, you'll still, I think, I don't think you'll capture anybody, but you may. Yeah, is that technology is just a, just a tool, I guess. It's definitely about how, how you apply it and, and the people, I, I totally agree. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, going going live. Um, I felt, and I think I might have said this before, but being prepared and not not really when when we went um, remote, we could have really tried to push forward and um, have this happen a lot sooner than it really did because like, we started to meet in January um, for this process and. 
we really could have pushed it along um, sooner, but we really wanted to do it right. So, um, so we went through and we had a clear picture of how we wanted to go about it. And I think with, uh, with Just Tech's help, it was really well structured. And because people started to use that new structure within the server, even though it wasn't in SharePoint and didn't look pretty, it still was the same structure. And because of that, it really made, I think, the launch of um, SharePoint a lot easier for us. And it's because we took a extended, extended time to do it and we really prepared well. Um, on the day of the, of the launch, what we did was we set up, I think it was a half day training where everybody, we went, we went did an overview of, um, of the SharePoint site, how it worked, how it integrated with legal server and really went through the nuts and bolts of it. But the problem with that is that um, a lot of times, as much as you do in one of those trainings, until the staff members really start to use the product, they can watch it and they might understand a little bit, but then that brings up a lot more questions. So what we did beyond that day of training, we scheduled individual um, meetings of just yeah, meetings with each unit to try to answer questions after they tried it for a few weeks. So we did that a few weeks out. We also, one of our staff members um, along with Just Tech put up and put together a lot of um, how to's and training support on the SharePoint site that if people had questions, they would be able to go to it and review it. So that was kind of our approach and it, then the training and being prepared ahead of time and having a training plan definitely was important to, um, to the whole process of going live. And um, yeah, and the post-launch, after we launched initially, the, um, the benefit, especially, and I mean, I can talk about being part of the admin team, was, um, was the fact that everything we have is in one place now. It's in an organized file structure. So if I want to, um, if I want to look at a specific grant application, or I, I know exactly where it is, and we've really done well in keeping that structure. I mean, although you, although you can add folders and delete folders and so forth, we really, um, we really have kept it. And I think it's worked really well within the admin team. It also helped out, like I mentioned earlier, the collaboration on documents and knowing what is the final version of any one document is really helpful. And even like when we're, I also oversee the finances of the organization, when we're moving forward to our audit each year, uh, I'm able and we're able to know where all of the um, all of the grant contracts are and everything, because we set it up in a way that we would all understand where it was. Where in the past, when we were on the server, it was all in one place, but you kind of would have to ask other staff members, "Well, where is this?" Because it wasn't a clear structure; it was separate. But just having that that systematic way of filing things, I think, made our lives a lot easier. The things that didn't go so well, um, and I don't know others' experience, but working with PD, um, SharePoint and Office 365 is really a Microsoft-based product, and it works great on Word, it works great on Excel, or any Word, any Microsoft-based product. But our staff members, and even myself, had great difficulty using PDFs, because you can't edit a work on PDFs in within the SharePoint um, system. What you need to do is if you want to edit or add anything, you have to download a deep PDF, open it up in Adobe, uh, we use Power PDF, make your changes, and then you have to upload it back to um, SharePoint. So it's like a two or three step process rather than just going into SharePoint, open a document app, working on it. And that really caused a lot of staff members concern and they, it, it led to not using the system as much as they should um, for PDFs. Um, the other challenge was really how each staff member um, accesses or would like to, they, they each have ways they operate or function uh, some the, differently. So some may prefer to be, one example would, would be within legal server. And when you're in legal server, you're on a client's folder a file, you then press a button and it 
brings you to the SharePoint site where you can work on documents, but you have to enter it through um, through the le through legal server. But other staff members were asking me, oh, I wanna see all of my clients within SharePoint. So because people work at it, work differently and have different systems to um, work on documents, we really try to, um, uh, as part of our um, revisions, we really try to help both ends of the spectrum to make it easier. Because to me, if this type of implementation is gonna be successful, you have to make it so that it is a lot, is it easier for staff and otherwise they'll just find workarounds and not work within the system. Um, I think that's anything else on that? That's that's. I think we can move on to the, the refinement and then improving stage. <laughs> okay, and um, okay. Yeah. So so with regard to um, we we launched it. We my, my staff members used it for um for about eight or nine months, and then I was talking to a few staff members, and what I found out was that some of them were saving all their documents to their C drive rather than to SharePoint. And then at some point they would upload it. But that um, that really concerned me obviously because nothing's backed up. It wasn't, at least when they saved it to the server, it was backed up even though the server was a mess. And they weren't you fully using the, um, the SharePoint system. This was on everybody, but this was a handful of people. So because of that, what we did was we launched a new project um, to refine and to improve SharePoint so that we could get even greater usage than we had. And what I did was I reconvened that same team. A few members might have done, might have switched out, but it was primarily the same people. And with that team, as well as with the um, librarian, we put together a survey for the staff. And, and that volunteer actually, the team came up with the list of questions, but that, um, that volunteer met with each staff individually and we're small enough, we only have 30 members, but asked them about their usage of SharePoint and found out what was concerned, what their concerns were, what they liked and what they thought could be done better. And, and what we found out, one thing we found out, I mean, that the PDF portion was really apparent. Um, the other thing, people were somewhat confused about what they did with their personal work, um, work related documents, because there wasn't really a structure for that at all. Um, and based on that, what we decided was, and when we, prior to, and let me back up for a second, prior to the pandemic, um, our staff, none of our staff had laptops. Everybody had just a desktop at the office, and we had two or three laptops that people could borrow, but nobody had their personal laptop. Because of the pandemic, now everybody has a desktop at work and their own laptop. But because it rolled out during the shutdown and we were giving our computers, we didn't necessarily um, set up OneDrive for each staff member. And it was really prior to the launch of SharePoint. So what we found was that people didn't, we did, never had a training on OneDrive. People weren't using OneDrive. And um, and that was part of the problem. So we decided we had to make sure that every staff member had OneDrive working on both their desktop and laptop, and it was syncing, and encourage them to use OneDrive for those um, personal documents rather than their C drive so they didn't lose it. We also um, decided when we first, there's a function within SharePoint where you can, um, where you can share a link to denote to the um, one to the SharePoint files within your own OneDrive, and where you since you shared that link, you actually can open up um, files on SharePoint, but it appears as though it's opening up on your desktop. So it it lets you it it looks as though it's like the experience that staff members have had for the past 30 years using a computer where they see file folders on your desktop and they click on it and they open up that document. And if it's a PDF, it will open up in Adobe or in whatever um, system you have on your desktop. But you're really working on the document that's saved to the cloud, that's saved to SharePoint. And by 
by implementing, uh, by deciding to, um, to add that feature in training staff members on how to use it, it really made staff members' life a lot easier because although they can go into SharePoint to work on documents, they could also have the documents that they use on a regular basis right in file folder links on their desktop. And, um, and that was probably the number one, uh, the, I think the, the most important thing we did as part, of, um, as part of the revisions. The other thing we did as part of this was, like I said, make sure that everybody has access to, um, to OneDrive so that now when people say, saves up either in uh, my files or any folder created within that OneDrive, it doesn't just live within their on their piece on their PC or on their laptop. It lives or it's saved and backed up um, within the cloud or to SharePoint. Um, and the other thing we did, we did some site refinements where there were some things that people saw and they didn't understand why it was where it was, or they wanted some additional links put in. We had um, Just Tech work with us to do that. And we also um, where we're just finalizing the stages where client files prior to the refinement, if somebody wanted access to a client file, they'd have to go into the legal server, um, go to the section of the legal server where all the SharePoint links are and click on that and that would bring you out to SharePoint. But now we're setting it up so that we actually um, have it so that the metadata from the from legal server flows into SharePoint and you can go into a site on SharePoint, a case file site, and see the client number, the client name, and um, whether the case is, who the primary advocate is, and whether the case is open or closed, or what the disposition is. And each staff member is able to see all of their cases on one list, and they can click while they're in SharePoint, open it up, and work on those files there. So that that would accommodate people who like to be in legal server are people who really like to see what all their cases look like um, on, on, um, on yeah, SharePoint. The other thing too we found was just the initial training we did really wasn't enough where people kind of got a fail for it, but they really needed more in-depth training to, um, to fully utilize SharePoint and legal server and the integration. So as part of this refinement, we um we had the Just Tech team come back and I think spend another two or three hours of training for all staff. And I think that really cleared up a lot of questions and and made the process much better going forward. Um, lessons learned from the whole process. I think training and ease of use and really being intuitive is key to make sure that the project is success. I think that um, I would have checked on staff's usage earlier than I did, because when I tell you, and at that eight month point, month point, when I found out that people were saving stuff to the C drive, that was, um, that was very concerning to me. And I would also have introduced um, OneDrive a lot earlier so that, um, so that people would be able to use that. And the, the fourth thing that I would do is if if you don't want to do the the um, sharing of SharePoint links to OneDrive, you really need to have a plan that staff can work on PDFs because I know a lot of our practice areas, although they use Word for writing briefs and so forth, there's forms and documents, and there's a lot of items they do work with on PDFs. And if they don't have a way that they can use it in the date like up in SharePoint, it's it really I think frustrates them and leads to them not using it the way it was designed. Great, thanks. Um, so I think um, there's there's a couple of questions that we'll get to. Um, I, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some key considerations, and then we'll we'll jump into some of the questions. Um, <clears throat> some of these things are sort of we've we've already touched on, but sort of clearly identifying your why. Why are you choosing SharePoint, and what problem are you trying to solve? Um, as John mentioned, really empowering internal champions to kind of help with the change management process. Um, this is, 
this is a little bit of a harder thing, but understanding what's possible and what's not um, within SharePoint, right? And, and I think this is um, something that organizations will often struggle with because when you're trying to implement a system that is um, as flexible and open, but also has these limitations, sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. And so, but, um, you know, trying to do some research or finding other folks to talk to first before you you dive into it um, so that you can uh, make sure you don't have any assumptions thinking that, oh, yeah, of course it does this only to find out that it doesn't, right? Um, understanding the integrations, both the automatic ones like um, Office integrations and then the ones that are more optional like case management systems. Um, <laughs> and and maybe not so seamless ones like like um, Adobe as John's mentioning, and then another key thing to consider is just making sure that you um, are setting in your mind that after you launch there will probably be a time when you realize there are things that we need to tweak and improve, and some of those things can be small, right? Um, small um, maybe changes to the way links are structured or or the <laughs> or what links are available. But then sometimes there's what um, one of my former supervisors used to say, things that are bigger than a breadbasket, things that are slightly bigger projects, which um, could you know, involve cost and time. And so then trying to decide then, okay, when do we undertake these bigger changes? Are they gonna require more training to our staff? Is it changing things from how we were doing it before? And then how do we balance that against the benefit that we'll get by making these changes. And so really um, making sure that you have like a, uh, an expectation that this is sort of a living system that will, will evolve. Um, I think with that, we can get into the questions. Um, so <coughs> one of the questions, John mentioned OneDrive as, as a key takeaway, like implementing OneDrive. So one of the questions is, what is the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint? Um, I will go ahead and tackle that as in as succinct a way as I think is possible. But OneDrive is essentially um, Microsoft's um, implementation of, of basically creating a way for individual users to have files that are saved in the cloud instead of saved on their hard drive, right? So when OneDrive is turned on, every person within your organization will see a section in their Windows File Explorer that is essentially their OneDrive kind of space. And so within that, they can create folders, um, save files to those folders, et cetera, um, and only they have access to those documents. So that's, um, um, so typically how that gets ends up getting used, John was saying that one of the things I realized early on people had these individual working files that didn't fit within the structure that their volunteer librarian helped them define, right? Because the and and because that structure that was being defined was a structure, a collaborative structure within SharePoint. But if, for example, I want to download a copy of the you know, holiday calendar for 2022, where do I save that? Rather than save it to a hard drive, OneDrive would be the, the location that I might save that. Um, other things might be like documents in progress that you don't want to like save to a location until you've sort of brought it along a certain to a certain extent, you could um, save it in OneDrive. So the, the way to think about the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint is OneDrive is for the individual and SharePoint is for the group, right? SharePoint is where the group files are and OneDrive is kind of where individual files reside. And as John was talking about the um, SharePoint um, integration with OneDrive, what that allows is within like say my individual OneDrive space, I can create shortcuts to a SharePoint location. So if I work on <laughs> you know, a set of five cases um, that like I currently just have five very active cases, I can create a shortcut to each of those case folders within SharePoint that just show up in my OneDrive. So I don't have to kind of go to SharePoint and navigate um, the SharePoint structure every time just to get um, if I'm just trying to jump very quickly to a set of um, locations within SharePoint. Um, so, the, you know, the, that's essentially like kind of creating bookmarks or um, if you've ever created like a Windows um, Windows shortcut, right? Uh, Windows shortcuts kind of are the, exactly the same thing. You can create a shortcut to files and folders within Windows. Um, it's, it's kind of the same functionality. Um, 
So as the final follow as a follow up question, is there additional cost for OneDrive? Um, most licenses, most organizational licenses will cover both SharePoint and OneDrive for the users uh, for an entire organization. Um, it's an enterprise level kind of feature, but most nonprofits probably have OneDrive included within their within their licensing already if they have SharePoint. And it's actually functionally the same technology on the back end. Um, OneDrive is like an additional layer on top of the SharePoint infrastructure. So um, yeah. So Tony, there was one other question uh, about the, for the archive. Uh, I guess this is for, uh, for you, John. So for the archive, is there succession planning in place for when you retire someday or the other person moves on? Is the question. <laughs> so, um, so for us, so it's not really all that complicated. I think people don't necessarily know where the link is, but I'm not sure we have it locked down that if somebody, if, if I think anybody really could get into it, I just don't want people to know that. But also there are two or three key people, who, people within the organization that know about it. Plus Just Tech knows about it as well. So, um, so those are a few places that if something were to, re to happen to me and I wasn't here, I think that um, I think they could figure it out. One other thing about the archive is you could also set it up to be um, to give some people read only access. If you're worried about them actively working within the archive, you could give them the ability to only see what's there and maybe make copies of it, but not necessarily, you know, work within it. Um, and then um, I guess um, wanted to see if there were other questions that people were had come up for people as we were presenting. I know we're at time, but we I think we can stick around for a few more minutes to see if there are other questions. Um, I have can, a couple of questions. Sure. Hi, John. I'm Jenny. I'm the executive director of Mental Health Advocacy Services in Los Angeles. So I'm really interested in this presentation, both because I feel like we're the organization that you were like four years ago before you did all this. And I'm also just interested in um, learning about you all and your program model um, since we have some overlapping program areas. Um, so thank you for sharing all this. I've been taking copious notes. Um, so, so we use Gmail and Google Share Drive and it's, uh, I have a lot of security concerns about that. Um, and I had never seen a SharePoint um, homepage until this and like my jaw dropped, like it was so pretty. It was so pretty. So I have so many questions. One, of, what, one immediate one was like, who updates that beautiful homepage? And do you actually like change those announcements in the middle regularly? Or do you end up welcoming Henry Nasella for like four months, um, which is fine. And then does your board have access to this? Do you use it as like a board dashboard? Um, so those are two of my many questions. I'll start with those. So, so our development director is the one who had, who any of us have access to it, but she's the one who's put this stuff up there. But we don't update it as much as we should, just because I think like any other organization, we have people wearing multiple hats and they're doing other things that, they're doing what's the fire that's there that's most important. So we don't update as much as we should, but it really is a good tool where we have a lot of volunteers. And when volunteers come in, we, if, if they'll be using our email, we also give them access to this and it gives them information about the organization. We don't provide, we could probably do a board book and set up a site for the board. We don't do that though. Yeah. Okay. And when you're talking about it being integrated with legal server, I mean, I guess I, I don't really understand like why you would do that if legal server is already like a robust system. We use, we just moved to legal server as well and has the security there. Like, I'm just like, what is the fun? Why, why would somebody like, are you creating duplicate records and does that cause any issues or like the people who say that they like working on their legal server cases in SharePoint, why do they like that? 
what are they able to get here that they're not able to get in legal server? I mean, legal, this looks a lot prettier than the legal server homepage does. Um, so I don't know if that's it, but. Yeah, so, so the reason why we moved and we wanted a real document management system is because my experience, our experience with legal server, and we've been with them for about five years now, is they have that document um, where you can store documents, but you really can't work on documents within that environment. What you need to do is upload documents. And then if there's any changes, you have to, or you want to change, you have to download it and then re-upload it, which is the user experience on that isn't great. And it's not, doesn't let you work on live documents. It's something that, in my experience with legal servers, they do a lot of stuff great, but like, like that Swiss Army night, because they do so much, they may not be the best option for everything where um, with that integration, somebody can be within the legal server client file and it appears the same way, those documents within that file, they click on a link and they're able to edit the Word document. They're able to do everything live and it saves automatically to SharePoint. So it really is a document management and document, document editing, editing program where um, in the past, where before we had um, SharePoint, it was really just a storage vessel where you put stuff there and then you took it out and put it back there. So it was a different type of integration and it really wasn't, I didn't think it was good enough and it really complicated staff members. So what we would do at the time is before that we had our server, people would work on all their documents and save it to the server. Then when they went to close the case, all of the final documents they put into, into legal server mm -hmm. because so they didn't have to do it multiple times. Mm -hmm. This takes away that step and makes sure that everything's saved and backed up. Got it. Um, yeah. Then that, that then it just really it's it just really is a cleaner process. Yeah. So for like for example, the organization chart I see is highlighted right now. So like, can you have um, an organization chart that's public to the whole organization, and then like the working version that you've limited access to, like yourself or whoever updates that and. So there's only like kind of like the published PDF version that everybody can see, but then there's also like the Word version or whatever the working version is when you have, when you're making changes that you also access here and change it. Exactly, yeah, not everybody has access to change that document. Most people who click on it can only view it. Okay. And they can't make any, um, but there's certain staff members who can make those changes and we try to, updated as much as we can. I think it, I think we use a, um, what is it? it and we use a different Microsoft um, product to, to do our organization job. The name just escapes me, but that, that, and then we just, it's just displayed there. So if somebody clicks on it, they're not seeing that live document they can edit. Yeah, and, and it bears mentioning there's a lot of um, permission controls within SharePoint. So you can set up like a document library that is open to all of staff and then one that is limited to say your management team, where you could have working versions or draft versions of like an HR manual or something. But then when you're ready to publish it to the rest of staff, you would just, you know, make a copy into the, the document library that's open to everybody, right? Um, and a, as John mentioned, you can also do that on a document level. So you could have a document that was the published version of the work chart, but then, you know, certain staff only have the ability to, um, to read it, but not actually edit it. But then that of course suggests that anytime you're making changes, you're making your complete set of changes every time you're making them, right? So it's, it might make more sense to have two different documents. One is like, you know, the, the living version and one is like the current published version of, of those things. How does your email connect, if at all, to all of this? Cause like one thing I'm thinking about is like what a pain it's gonna be if we move away from Gmail. Um, like, I want this pretty website. Do I have to um, go to Microsoft email? I mean, not that I mind Microsoft email. I just like, you know, it's going to be a pain. So is there a way that like email actually integrates with documents and stuff here? Is that really necessary to make that change if we do this? John, did you guys implement any email integration at all? So we had actually um, migrated to 
Office 365 email about four years prior to that. So we that we've been using that system, and I think we were on Microsoft Exchange before that. So it's not as though we were in another. Yeah. Else um, I, I will say that Outlook is not um, integrated heavily with SharePoint in some ways, because if you think about it, SharePoint is, is more about content and documents. And so the one way that it is very usefully integrated is when you're um, writing an email in Outlook and you want to attach a file, if you click on the attachment link, it will show you your most recently kind of use documents, including ones that are saved in SharePoint. So if you're editing, like for example, this PowerPoint deck, I was sending it back and forth to John and Steve. And so when I needed to attach a copy to them, I could just from Outlook, click on the attachments link and it was at the top of the list because it was the thing that I was working on in SharePoint most recently. That's that's probably the main way it's integrated, um, but I, I, it's not, there are a lot of other integrations that you can kind of implement in SharePoint with Outlook, but they're often third party solutions that you have to kind of, um, you have to um, spend some time kind of working through and may have additional costs. So some people like wanna save Outlook emails to a SharePoint um, folder. That's not, um, th that's not out of the box integrated. You either have to buy a third party solution or there's like, so I, I would say that um, there are, many people who are on um, um, Google um, Google Suite um, environment that still use SharePoint and, and it's not exactly um, seamless in, in some ways, but it's also not a huge barrier like that Outlook would give you a ton more kind of options. Um, and then just a, a point I will mention there, there are a lot of um, organizations, companies that started using Google Drive and have started to use SharePoint because of some of the more granular permissions controls um, for some of the same security and sort of um, permissions concerns that you had. Um, SharePoint does offer slightly more granular control than I think Google Drive does. Interesting. <laughs> and it's more secure, I would assume SharePoint has like good security. It, it I, I would say it's more secure in the sense that you that um, as the administrators, you can control the permissions and how things are getting shared. Um, there's there's more <laughs> levels of control. Um, in terms of the technical security, like it's security against hacking, I, I can't speak to that, but I, I would assume that Google has the same sort of level or has a similar level of rigor that Microsoft does in sort of preventing um, malicious attacks and things like that. But the, the security, the way people have talked about SharePoint being much more secure, um, at least in my experience, has been that it's um, easier for administrators to keep staff from inadvertently sharing things out that they don't mean to share like mm. that. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a chat function? Not built into SharePoint. And that's where the sort of complexity of understanding SharePoint, a SharePoint implementation comes in. Um, because that's what Microsoft Teams is for. <laughs> and so Microsoft Teams and SharePoint, it can create some confusion about which you should use for which purpose, because mm -hmm. they're both collaboration platforms within the Microsoft um, ecosystem. But so Microsoft Teams is typically what organizations will use for real-time chat. Um, and SharePoint is more for document and um, collaboration and communications, uh, like not real-time communications, but you know, um, broadcasting out information. Yeah. So, and one thing on that integration with um, Microsoft Teams, because we use that as well, um, it also technically when you use Microsoft Teams and you have um, the communication device, you actually create a SharePoint site by creating a team. And if you look down on this sample that's being shared on the left hand side, um, I had created a, a for our diversity council. I created a communication platform for the diversity council within our organization where they could communicate and chat and everything. And we use that all the time. You can also save documents there. But when you create that site, you actually create by doing that and not doing it within the SharePoint realm, you create a SharePoint site that's part of the structure, which I was able to put a link to 
so that anybody who has access to that team will see this on their um, on their SharePoint site and can click and see all the documents on that team. I think they can also see the chats as well yeah. within the SharePoint environment. So, yeah. so they're separate and they're different, but because it's all Microsoft, and again, this is a non-technician saying this, um, they're, they're somehow connected. They, they are connected. It does create some user confusion sometimes, right? Because, um, and, and so you have to really think through how you want to train your, your users on what the difference is between SharePoint and Teams and, and what they, you know, what they should kind of use each for, because um, there is some overlapping kind of functionality too. And so it does, like I was saying before, um, there aren't a ton of guardrails. And so sometimes organizations have to put up their own kind of structures and guardrails to make it easier for people to understand. Um, I think, I, I, are there other questions? Um, and, and Jenny, I appreciate that you have, <laughs> I mean, that you probably do have more questions. Um, maybe what we can do is uh, make sure that you have all of our contact information and um, and John's contact information definitely since there's seems to be some uh, some um, not just you know interest in SharePoint but like uh, you know re relative to your respective missions a lot of similarities there. Um, it, it's if I could just add one more thing too. The um, this might be help you, Jenny, but obviously because we have social workers and attorneys. Um, what can be shared between them, it's critical to make sure that certain things are not shared. And that's one reason why, I mean, we have both our counseling program and our legal program in on legal server, but we have it set up on legal server so that um, I think it's by, you know, if it's unit or by what, what the technical term is, but if a counselor goes into legal server, they can only see counseling cases and vice versa. If an attorney goes in, they can only see legal cases. We've set this up the same way so that if you go into SharePoint and try, if a counselor goes into SharePoint and tries to look at a legal case, they don't have access to it. And, and the same thing at the top level, if you see the various units within the organization, the admin site, only members of the admin team can see, if anybody else clicks that, they won't see anything. You have to be have admin, admin team permissions to get into that site, and that's a true across the board, to make sure that um, our attorneys can't see counseling data and vice versa. Yeah, that's a, that's definitely a great point. So managing sort of what people can see and, and access um, using different uh, user groups, depending on you know attributes for that user. So. Um, yeah, it's a it's a key kind of piece of functionality within SharePoint that that helps you limit um, exposure to different pieces of content. Well, I guess if um, we'll 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 end there. Um, and I think um, Shelley has mentioned in the chat um, that you can join the the listserv to see if there's been past you know. Um, chat or discussions uh, about some of the, the topics that were raised today. And then also um, we will make sure that um, the folks that registered and attended today, um, you can get contact information and access to the slide deck. And uh, I think this presentation will also be posted to the LSN TAP um, YouTube channel as well. So great. Thank you everyone. And thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much for your time today and your generosity and sharing with us. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.